Okay. Yeah, so hello everybody. So it is good to be here and speak in front of people. So uh, I'm Mathieu Bart, working in a very small company uh, in Belgium. The company is called Tessares. Uh, I hope you will be nice with me because uh, I'm not in the company of Matt as uh, initially planned, uh, but Matt is not too far. I mean, yes, he's far because uh, he's uh, more than 7,000 kilometers away, but uh, I think he's connected. Also because uh, he's not present here, so if you have any question, he will be glad to answer instead of me. Anyway, um, also if you have any question about uh, MPCP, uh, Paolo Abeni is also there. No, it's just that he's the most productive uh, MPCP developer for the moment. Um, but also just be careful that uh, it might cost you some beer if you ask you some question, ask him some question. Anyway. Um, about the agenda for today, so I'm uh, of course going to talk about MPCP, but not just about MPCP, but I'm going to introduce uh, MPCP for those who uh, don't know or don't remember what it is, uh, but don't worry, it will not be uh, too long. Um, I will also uh, quickly list what's new and what has, because that has been requested by, uh, I think, a lot of people. In one person, will not say who, for you not to blame him, but uh, thank, thank you, Jacob, for the idea. Um, at the end, the goal of this introduction about MPCP is to understand uh, the key concept needed to follow the rest of the presentation. So MPCP will be your use case to talk about issues uh, that other network subsystem and probably others can have. Uh, so, yes, we will talk about extending kernel functionality with a focus on Netlink and eBPF uh, and hopefully uh, have some answer or start discussion about issues. Um, so, that this will not be a very technical call, uh, talk. Uh, it is late and I will try to talk more about concept and ideas. I hope that's all right. So, MPTCP, what it is. So, MPTCP is short for multipass TCP. Uh, this is an extension to TCP that breaks the assumption that a connection is linked to a fixed five tuples. So in one sentence, it allows to exchange data for a single connection over different paths simultaneously. So you can have more redundancy, more bandwidth, and more many things. Know that you can use multiple paths. A, a typical use case is represented here with a smartphone having access to two different networks. Um, that's very common today, but of course, when TCP was designed in the 70s, that was really not common. Um, when you have access to multiple networks, you might want to use them all at the same time, like they did in South Korea, for example, or you might also want to nicely support handovers, so seamlessly switching between networks when the first symptoms are being detected. So that's what Apple is still doing to, today with MPTCP to improve the end user experience for mobility use cases. So note that on the wire, we can see TCP packets with some MPTCP options. So each sub connection, so what we call subflow, is a TCP connection. So it has been started with a three way handshake, finishing with a fin exchange or a reset or of causal timeout. Uh, but it is important to act like that just to survive on a wild internet with nasty middle boxes that we have today. So a small note also that to say that uh, MPCP is even part of 5G specifications from the 3GPP initiative with the ATSSS module. So yes, it means that uh, if you got a COVID vaccine recently, you might already have 5G in your arm and you may be using MPTCP without even noticing. Um, what we have today, so uh, last time we spoke at uh, LPC, it was in 2019. So MPTCP was not even upstream yet. So instead of a what's new, uh, I can present here what's there. So MPTCP is opt-in. Uh, if you want it, you can create a dedicated socket with IP proto MPTCP instead of TCP. Then you use it like you would do with TCP. That's it. 
So thanks to that, it is also easily possible to force applications to create an MPCP socket instead of a TCP one with a classic LD preload. That's what MPCPI's tool is designed for. The goal here is not to go into details about the MPCP core implementation, but it is important to note that MPCP doesn't affect TCP performances and only a very few modifications have been done in TCP code thanks to TCP upper layer protocol to manage the different supports. So it, it might be interesting to note that uh, MPCP extend the SKB structure only when needed, thanks to the SKB extension infrastructure put in place by Flor Florian Westphal at the beginning of the project. Um, for any technical details about the implementation, I do recommend you to watch uh, Paolo's talk he gave at DevConf, if you remember. <laughs> was in Berno, um, and, and also uh, Florian's presentation about SKB extension from a previous NetDev. Um, so I'm coming back to the slide with the third point. Um, most of the protocol features have already been implemented. So it is possible to have multiple subflows, uh, announce addresses and priority from one peer to another, uh, can also support what we call fast close, so it's the equivalent of TCP reset, but for the whole MPCP connection. Um, we can also explain reset and many other things. Uh, most common socket options from upper uh, protocol are supported. So the complexity is to know what to do when there are multiple subflows, especially if they are created later on during the connection. Typically, socket option values um, are propagated to all subflows, even the subflows that are not created when the set socket uh, syscall was called. Of course, this needs to be checked uh, case by case. So some options don't make sense for MPCP, like if they are specific to other protocols. Some cannot work with MPCP, like uh, TCP MD MD5s, uh, option, there are not enough space. Uh, some only affect the MPCCP sockets and not the subflow, like um, poll related ones. Um, yeah, some also are only for the first subflow, like uh, TFO, and yeah, there, there are other, other cases, of course. Um, still, some socket options deserve more love, and less common ones still need to be implemented. So if you don't know what to do next weekend, you can always look at that. But um, yeah, um, the two last points here, um, it is possible to get info from different areas like uh, MIP counters, uh, INET DIAC interface, and also uh, MPCP info. Um, that's a socket option that is similar to a TCP info. Um, there are also two pass manager and one packet scheduler, but uh, I will come back on that later. Um, so what we will have, um, here is a short list of what we can expect in the coming versions. So we would like to have more control from user space to support more use cases and more adapted control. Um, TCP fast open support also for MPCP should come soon. Uh, more socket options, uh, maybe a TCP congestion control taking into account multiple paths, who knows? Uh, I know that this was a hot topic a few years ago, but probably most use cases don't need that, uh, and hopefully even more. So that's it for the introduction for MPCP. Um, it's time to talk about extensions. So we start here by looking at extending kernel functionality using Netlink for the communication between the user space and the kernel space. I already mentioned that MPCP can expose information um, to the INET DIAG interface. Uh, this is, of course, done via Netlink, but I don't think it is interesting to present that. It's rather common, and already mentioned that today. Um, instead, let's look at two different components in the MPCP infrastructure that are a bit particular and have values to be controlled from user space. So the first component to extend is the path manager. 
Uh, this component is in charge of creating additional subflows, so what we call paths, removing them if needed, announcing addresses, priority, and others. Uh, you need it on both ends, but to serve different purposes. For example, it's traditionally, traditionally the clients who create new paths. This is, in fact, an excellent use case for the Netlink protocol. Here, within MPTCP Pass Manager, we have two different usages. In fact, we even have what we call two different Pass Managers. We have a classical way where we can change global settings to define some parameters per net namespace. This can be done via IP route to tool, for example, like Mediana network settings. Here, you would use IP MPTCP to set IP addresses and points and limits. Uh, note that the latest version of Network Manager, so it, uh, version 1.40, I think, has also support uh, for some of these settings. So it is easier today to get MPTCP properly configured. Uh, more interestingly, uh, the kernel can also notify the user space via Netlink when MPTCP connections are being created, established, and closed. So we can also have the same events for each of flows and also when some signals are received, like uh, the other peer announcing or removing an address. On the user space side, a tool like MPCPD list, can listen to these different events and send some comments to create new subflows or announce addresses. So in short, the user space can control Pass Manager and make decisions per connection. So let's look at the pros and cons. So on, on the one hand, Netlink is well known, well tested, clear, even if this can be improved. So imagine maybe having a, a nice description in YAML, for example. Um, it is also complete and stable. Uh, so it has been existed for a long time, so I, I probably looked at the same uh, Wikipedia page uh, as the one Jacob mentioned this morning. So yes, it has been created in the 90s. Uh, do you know that at that time, Internet Explorer 6 didn't even exist? Quite long, a long time ago. Uh, only a, uh, one small tweak was needed. Um, the goal was to optionally restrict generic Netlink multicast even group access for subscriber with capnet admin, quite specific. Uh, but in other words, for security reason, we don't want everybody to get access to the token. Uh, the token is used as an identifier in the different events, but the token is also used to create new subflows. So this information could be used to hijack uh, existing connection, for example. So that's why we want to hide it and to restrict it to, uh, to some users. On the other hand, uh, this protocol is not designed to have kernel to user space request. Um, what I call a request is um, to have the kernel waiting for some feedback from user space to continue. So for example, uh, when a new subflow request is received by a server, the kernel, the kernel cannot send a message via netlink to user space take a break, waiting for the user space to reply if the request can or cannot be accepted. So that's not something that we can have. Uh, but the kernel can send uh, events to subscriber. Uh, the user space can request a modification, but the kernel cannot really block. It, it could be possible to share some rules to the kernel or add packets in a waiting queue like it is done uh, with NetFilter but it feels less natural somehow, and we want to avoid in, uh, implementing another net filter-like architecture in MPCP. Um, another thing is when there are what we call too many events. Um, so imagine a, a busy server dealing with thousands of connection requests per second using in parallel multiple network queue and multiple workers to deal with that. But on the other hand, there is only one Netlink socket dealing with all the different events. So imagine that 
all the events we can have, especially for short connection. So uh, like we have, hello, there is a new connection request, and then uh, the connection is established now. Oh, wait, there is uh, a new subflow um, and another one. Oh no, in fact, uh, this subflow is closed. Oh, in fact, sorry, all the connection is closed. So uh, what I just want to say is that you can have plenty of messages and each time some data are provided, like the token, IP addresses, uh, port, source and destination. So you need all of that to make proper decision, but then the buffer link to this socket can be quickly filled if uh, the user space cannot process all of them. And that's when you start losing events. So of course you can always tweak the buffer, but then it certainly means that there is there are some latency between the when the event is emitted and when it is processed by the user space. You can probably start looking at having multiple channels somehow, but that doesn't feel natural as well. So you probably need to accept the limitation, which maybe is not a real limitation because this kind of server probably doesn't need to have a user space pass manager and do that per connection. It is probably enough to configure the global settings. So maybe that's not a real use case. And then maybe not a limitation and netling is perfect for this job. Anyway, um, in this example, there are a few events per MPC connection, but what if you want to make decision per packet that needs to be queued on the best path? Uh, we can have a look at that. And BPF. Um, BPF is the solution to all our problem. I heard that once, I think, or in fact, plenty of times. So like what you can hear about 5G, like, uh, but I don't think that there is BPF causing COVID vaccine, but that's another topic. Uh, anyway, back to the presentation with the last part, uh, BPF extension. There is another component within MPTCP that makes sense to extend, to be adapted to different use cases. This component is in charge of deciding on which paths, which available paths, and the next packets will be sent to. So it can also decide to retransmit one packet to another path if needed, and that's what we call a reinjection. Of course, extending this cannot be done using Netlink. A scheduling decision needs uh, need to be done per packet, so it's hard to imagine the overhead of sending a notification to user space, waking it up, having context switches, etc. And that would be for each individual MPCP packet, data and ACK included. Um, Netlink or any other involvement of user space is just too much overhead. Um, some might say that we could have the user space providing some policy in advance, like with NetFilter, like I said before, but packet scheduling job needs to take into account too many parameters to have good results. So for example, some links might be more costly to use, like redundancy or so might be needed in some cases. Um, some paths might be congested, maybe with buffer bloat, the path might appear to be stored, etc. So you can even have tricky situations like uh, the, local, the local buffers might not be big enough to support the combined BDP of each path, but then what to do? Um, which path not to fully use in this case? So it makes sense to move all this complexity out of the kernel code and focus on generic use cases inside the kernel. So we started to look at the different possibilities to allow the user space to control the packet scheduler. First, it would be silly these days not to consider BPF for this job. I guess if we didn't, I could not give this presentation today. Here it is. But more seriously, when we look at um, other modular components being involved in the, in the packet scheduling in the network stack, an obvious one that comes to mind is TCP congestion control. The algorithm is deeply integrated in TCP code. Um, there are callbacks to update some info when packets are received. We cannot really have the kernel waking up in a uh, user space application to delegate this specific part. I guess that if we want to delegate that to an application, we will need to delegate 
much more than just the connection control part, but then we are taking a, talking about a different network stack implementation, like with um, DPDK or its VPP, for example. Um, back to the TCP CC in the Linux kernel. Uh, since 2005, the TCP uh, congestion control algorithm are pluggable. So before there were a bunch of uh, conditions in TCP input file with different function dedicated to different algorithm. So the situation has improved and each algo is now implemented in a different kernel module. It is nice, each algo is isolated uh, adding new one doesn't impact others. Um, multiple ones can also be used on the system for different connections, of course. But of course, it is less good when we think about Spectre and all of that, but there are solutions for that. And I don't think we need to focus on that part. No. Uh, yesterday, Martin talked about what happened in 2020. Um, so he added the possibility to create new TCP CC with uh, BPF, thanks to a new BPF struct opt infrastructure. And Kubic and DCTCP algo have been re implemented to show the feasibility and the code is similar to the existing kernel module. So that really looks great. Um, that can work for use case in MPCP with the packet scheduler. So, what's again BPF to the rescue? So, we are not BPF experts, but uh, one of us. Uh, Ge Liang Tang, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, started to look at doing the same with MPCP packet scheduler. And there are even RFC patches available in all three. It is using the BPF structure infrastructure, and we can declare new MPCP packet scheduler in BPF like we would do if we wanted to create new packet scheduler in a kernel module. So we would probably engage, uh, we would have probably engaged discussion with BPF maintainer earlier, but um, before asking if we are going into the right direction, I should probably add a few more things. Um, before working on that, we had a single packet scheduler, so not pluggable via kernel modules or something else. Uh, the isolation was already a bit there, but still the kernel module aspect was not. So. Um, Anyway, we, we knew that if we wanted to support multiple packet schedulers, uh, we had to do the, um, this isolation work. So that, that's all right, in fact. Um, but introducing new kernel modules seems a bit old school, um, but somehow it is uh, required for BPS structure up. So let's do that. Um, also, what bothers us more is that Apart from TCP congestion control algorithm, it looks like there are no other use of BPF struct ops. So what I also want to say is that um, for the TCP congestion control part, um, the kernel module infrastructure was already there and ad adding BPF struct ops seems the right way to do. So it is in, continu in continuity with what was already there. So it, it was making sense, but what about us? Um, is BPF strict jobs what we need, or maybe we are missing something? Uh, we can come back to that later. Um, but if we are going to the right direction, we don't have a bunch of questions. So initially, we wanted to avoid maintaining different kernel modules to avoid the same issues as what is visible with TCP CC side. So kernel module don't allow the fast turnaround for testing new algorithm in production. Uh, plus, there is a maintain maintain a, yeah, this word uh, maintainability question uh, if there are many modules in the kernel. Um, but here we, we can also say, fine, we, we just have to implement one module specific to BPF and we maintain the generic one. So seems all right. But opening up more flexibility has, of course, impact. Uh, packet schedulers implemented in BPF um, will have a performance impact if we compare it to the default packet scheduler in the kernel due to the extra layer we are adding in the indirect calls, but that's for good reasons and it is then acceptable. 
And yeah, again, we are not really uh, uh, expert in BPF, and maybe we should have asked uh, the, the question elsewhere. But um, and the other thing is that I don't feel very comfortable because uh, the work was mainly done by Gillian and Matt. Uh, but here are the the first question. Um, we quickly realized that if there is a possibility to run multiple packet schedulers, then we might need to adapt the API to allow more behavior. We still have plenty of questions related to the API for the packet scheduler, but that's internal to MPCP. But how is the API considered? I mean, when we talk about kernel modules, I guess it is better not to break the internal API. But if it is needed, we can break it. Um, here, if the API is somehow exposed to user space via BPF, do we have not to break it and maintain like different API version? Like, so same question for uh, BPF helpers we are introducing. Can we, for example, change the signature? And I guess the, this question has been replied by Alexei uh, during his talk yesterday, but I guess BPS follow um, the kernel, so that can we can have breakages, uh, and I guess there are solutions to minimize the, the impact. So I guess it's fine. Also, um, then I have another question: um, How to deal with uh, atomic operations? Like there are no uh, read ones or white ones, for example, in BPF, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not an expert, but uh, the workaround that we found uh, is to add BPF helpers with new BPF KFUNC um, to deal with all these atomic operations. Uh, so we don't know if it's the correct way. But, I mean, you did you look at uh, uh, read runs, write runs by uh, you know adapting the macros from the kernel and use them, using them in your BPF program? Not, does it not work for you, or it? It was not working when Galen was looking at it, but we maybe missed something, or maybe we're well, we have uh, uh, Young Hong here, so you can answer. Young Hong. Okay. No? I... The question is uh, apparently read ones, write ones don't work if you uh, use them in your BPF C code. Okay. Yeah. Um, what we need for the packet scheduler is to use, for example, read ones and write ones. Um, uh, but when we try in BPF, or at least maybe at the time it was not working, so we don't know if it was. We, we do have uh, atomic instructions available uh, uh, with uh, probably the LVM 14. Uh, we have a set of atomic add uh, subtraction. And uh, also a multiplication and a shift, and also a compare and exchange. To be able to okay. satisfy your need. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why you need read ones and write ones in the BPF program because it's already there in the the spec, the BPF spec. There is no load and store tiering with the BPF. Okay. Yeah. Because when also looking at Paolo for the scheduling part. <laughs> um, I was saying that actually I, I did not follow closely the FC purchase, so I for question regarding why the, yeah. the read-ons is required, why write-ons is required. I mean, did it might not be needed. Um, yeah, maybe what what was also also done is like uh, they look at the current uh, implementation we have on the scheduler part, and maybe they overlooked at something. From a logical point of view, I think that the scheduler may need to access uh, some information from the subflows while not holding the while not adding the subflow slot and. It will be C code. I will use a redons there. Yeah. 
And, and I don't know if we need to, so to look at what's happening on the other subflow link to the same connection. Some operation. But uh, okay, if, the, if there are solution, and even better if we don't need it, that's, that's really great. Um, yeah, so uh, then I can look at uh, the next question we have. Um, there are also some security concerns. Um, maybe that's not really uh, an issue, but uh, for example, like a kernel module, the BPF module will have access to the connection token. Uh, so it, it is useful because it is an identifier, but it can also be used to create new uh, subflows from other IP. So we are opening up access to more info via BPF. And we were just wondering if there are security guidelines somewhere or, or if we don't have to worry because it's like an L module to have access to everything, we trust them, it's fine. Probably. But that's something also that we will um, put in a cover letters when we will send them to uh, BPF maintainers because something that might be important to look at. And because I see that I'm a bit late, I will conclude. Um, so we hope that uh, MPCP will be adapted to everyone's need. Uh, we hope to have a BPF packet scheduler soon, um, and even maybe a pass manager, we never know. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, remember that Paolo is still there. <laughs> any last question or comments? <laughs> Before Paolo runs out. <laughs> Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.